Welcome to GUI and Email Browsers for 11th of March 2020. We have agenda, we got folks, and we got hack getting cozy. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. The first, the first one is Stardust. Hey everyone, so uh, the initial implementation PR for Stardust got uh, merged last week and uh, a release candidate was also made. Uh, with that, I already got uh, JSLPTP and uh, JSTPFS browser examples using it. And uh, yeah, everything seems to be working uh, for both uh, transport and discovery. So uh, the, initial, the current status now is that those examples will need to be reviewed and uh, with that uh, we will release the final version of Stardust and uh, at the same time I will be now working on uh, getting a docker image so that uh, uh, infra team will have a easy time on uh, deploying it so yeah uh, I think we are on a good shape on Stardust to get it uh, uh, to JSIPFS really soon. That's super cool. Uh, I talked with, with Jacob before uh, on the WebRTC one, the Docker image. Uh, we, like, like, I understand the plan is for those Docker images to be not only useful for our infra, but for like anyone who wants to run their own and don't want to care about all the dependencies, they would just run a, a Docker image in their own infra. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Super cool. Wait, when you say that the browser examples are happy, what does, what does that mean? Are there examples that are checked in? Are there uh, you know, a bunch uh, of examples that people I, can copy and paste and use? And yeah, I mean, uh, basically, both in uh, JSLPTP and JSIPFS, we have uh, browser examples, which before the refactor, we're using uh, WebRTC star and the WebSocket star for uh, uh, transport and discovery of peers. Uh, and basically, uh, so after the refactor, they got just to uh, working using a WebRTC star. And now in the examples, what I did was to, in initial phase, just to uh, remove WebRTC star and just rely on uh, Stardust and check if everything was working as before. Uh, and it is. And then uh, uh, I basically tried both together, WebRTC star and Stardust. Uh, and uh, now in the current PR state, uh, the goal is to uh, basically people integrate Stardust. The code is like commented and uh, in the example, people are guided on how to configure them. But uh, we, uh, me and Jacob were discussing if uh, when we have this deployed and we don't need to like go with peer IDs and stuff like that, we can eventually just make it to uh, work and people just can run the example instead of uh, needing to do this initial configuration part. Okay, thank, thanks for clarifying. One thing that I maybe I misunderstood, I thought Stardust did not use WebRTC. Uh, no, it doesn't use WebRTC. So, so if we're, I just want to make sure that if we're switching things to Stardust, but then if people are still using WebRTC star, that we're not like uh, turning off tests for that transport or reducing the number of transports available to people. No, or are ideal, people not using WebRTC star in practice right now anyway? Uh, they are there. It's the only, uh, currently it's the only transport uh, for a browser, uh, like with discovery, of course. So they are, they are using it. And uh, the goal would be for now for them to use both because Using both, they will be able to discover more peers than just using Got Stardust. Or... So they'll use Stardust and WebRTC star for now. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, and just like additional cl clarification is what what does it mean? Examples are happy. At least in JSIPFS, I believe there is uh, additional orchestration which runs tests uh, that check if each uh, example does what it's supposed to do like so yeah, yeah it is all, the test is also uh, green using Stardust 
Yeah, yeah. H historically, we had a situation when uh, ch uh, changes were made to JSIPFS or JSIPFS HTTP client, uh, but we forgot to update examples and people uh, looked at examples and that was a pretty bad experience. So now we got, uh, that's a part of our CI setup. The CI will fail if a uh, change you made broke examples. So you need to like update examples if you make breaking changes. Uh, so that's why it's important. Uh, yep. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, IETF, for some reason, I always struggle to spell it. It's a short acronym, but. All those vowels at the beginning. Uh, yeah, so we talked about uh, IETF. Roll off the tongue. Yeah, in Madrid, um, going to that in, in representing. So I was thinking, wondering, like, are the, what should we be doing, if anything, uh, leading up to that in terms of like, uh, whether it's PR or awareness or prep for discussions at IETF? Um, so that we can either like get those on the plate for discussion there um, or just like get more community awareness um, leading up to that. Yeah, that's, that's a, thanks for bringing that up. That's a great idea. I, I list, linked to the, I, so I, 107 is about to happen. I think it's like next week, or something like that. And it's uh, great to be able to walk through the sessions there and you can see kind of what the topics are that people are, are discussing, which is a, a great way to get a get an overview of what the range of discussion is, what types of technologies are being discussed. Uh, I'm also gonna add another link to, Giannis wrote up a list of groups he thought we would be interested in as PL. So I'll link to that document here in the notes as well, um, which is would be good, a narrower field of view around his experience and what he's recommending. Um, Quick's canceled. I hope Quick's not canceled. We're just about to ship it. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, it, it's interesting. So it, I think more than anything, I think there's probably going to be some public communication. Like we'll announce as PL who's going to be there and what we're interested in doing. We'll, we're thinking about running an event too, like you know, like maybe a happy hour or a meet and greet that type of thing. Nothing, nothing crazy. Um, um, but I, I think for 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 this group, number one is get familiar with the set of content. Uh, look at the YouTube the ITF YouTube, like every session is recorded. So I think what would be cool is like this list here of, of the schedule is figure out which one of these we all maybe want to watch later and then talk about. So we could like pick some of those sessions that we think would be interesting to learn about. And then um, in a later browser connectivity meeting, set aside 15 minutes or something like that and kind of review what we learned from watching the different videos or specific videos. Uh, uh, like, like when the web packaging, uh, uh, defense of web packaging was happening. Um, that was a fascinating video because you really get a sense for, um, for, for one, like the nature of the discussion, how there's different Q and A, like people can get up on stage, uh, and choose to have, uh, open up a discussion around an area. And, uh, this was a very contentious one. So you had people from Cloudflare and Mozilla and Google battling it out in, in an open discussion, which is really fascinating to see, um, to see the back and forth and the nature of, of what the critical discussion actually looks like in some of these sessions. Uh, and then there's also separate birds of a feather. So, um, you know, like we could do something like uh, run a birds of a feather around uh, people who are interested in P2P network protocols and things like that. Uh, there's also like, you know, it'd be great. Maybe we should have Giannis come and talk a little bit about it as a, as a guest speaker here for this meeting to talk to folks about how his experiences so far, because there's basically like two parts. There's the IETF and there's also the IRTF. And one's more academic and one's more uh, in like pr uh, pr protocols and standards that are in use of production today. So that you have these also like even within the whole overall organization, there, there are different uh, mega subgroups there. Uh, and it's also very contentious. Like um, Jessica introduced us to uh, kind of one of, one of the one of the fathers of the organization, um, and he, uh, and he's he he had some interesting feedback on like just how useful it is for different things and where where things can get stuck in ITF, uh, where this the kind of standards effort is really can really be us a, uh, a um, uh, you know anti be the opposite of momentum where getting a bunch of different people to try and agree on something can sometimes be not the most effective way of driving it forward. 
Um, so it, it's good to understand like the relative pros and cons of there, but I think just being in this conversation and, and for all of us, you know, if we are joining, uh, being present, watching how it works, learning what we can, it's gonna be the priority as opposed to say any specific, any specific individual spike or goal there. I think, you know, V1 of us hanging out at these meetings, just learning and soaking in as much as possible, meeting a bunch of people, making connections and understanding where, 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 you know, we have, we have kind of three ways that we do things, right? Um, one is, one is integrating with existing software. Uh, two is ignoring all existing software and writing our own stuff and writing around it. And then third is these kind of like participation, these long running broader discussions around the arc of how software changes over time and how we think about it as a, as a broader group of, of practitioners. So uh, understanding where places like the ITF and certain groups or people there can help us with w making those decisions. And how I'm looking at it. It's one of the three, but it's, it's not a magic bullet. It's got its problems, it's own baggage. Yeah, that sounds good. I think, yeah having a that clear under clear understanding of like what we're going there for why we're attempting to do there and like are there things that we should prep or prep the community or make loud noises before we before we go some some noise but not too loud a noise yeah. soft, really just... soft, soothing beach sounds yeah. <laughs> that, that would be a great blog post title ITM for late soothing beach sounds there's no beach anywhere but near madrid man <laughs> ITF asmr yeah, for sure. Uh, I think it's very useful to watch, like, to, to at least, like, as a homework, pick some sessions who are relevant to, to your interests and see, see how they, uh, they work, like, what's the dynamic, especially the one uh, Dietrich mentions for the web packaging from Google. It's, like, sort of on an extreme part, but it gives you a, a good feeling of how open and how open that uh, discussion is. And when you like bring a proposal, you need to be either prepared or you need to be prepared for uh, defense or for uh, something like uh, what happened there. Um, super useful just to uh, prepare yourself. Or, or, or don't watch it because it might scare you off from ever presenting. <laughs> Too late. Yep, uh, super, super useful. Um, should we review goals from the week now? Yeah, let me uh, op open this up to slide number 153. Do you want to like share screen share? Yeah. Um, All right. Um, I just wanted to do a quick review with this group to see uh, whether or not these are still the, uh, these these goals make sense. Um, this, this I know, you know, we've been tracking and Lytle's been pushing hard on, on this as a high priority uh, and really affects our whole ecosystem kind of of how we ship IPFS. Uh, the connectivity and maintenance, we just talked about Stardust. It's fantastic. That looks like that is on track and, and, and landing soon. Um, the companion refactor, uh, I'm kind of curious about whether that's still a goal for for this first couple of quarters and how high priority that is? Uh, it needs to happen in Q2. Uh, okay. Like we are not able to like sh ship anything new with Companion. We are not able to go dog food, go uh, like JSIPFS, uh, JSIPFS HCP client, uh, not able to like- So that sounds pretty high priority. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it needs to happen, Q2. All right, and then uh, the Peer Store V2. Is that still on tr on deck for Q2? Yeah, so in the peer store V2, it's uh, where I'm starting to creating some discussion around it. Uh, me, Jacob, and Jan has already talked briefly about it on uh, on the IPFS team week, and we got uh, some initial cool ideas. Basically, uh, peer store V2 is something that uh, I've been di discussing for a, a while on uh, Libit P, but it was not really a priority so far to be implemented in uh, in Go. So the discussion got kind of blocked a while ago. And now the plan is to revamp that uh, discussion in order to for us to upgrade to Peer Server 2 and with that get lots of uh, benefits for the browser, namely getting uh, uh, persisted peers so that the 
when you put your node for the second time, you can immediately try to connect to the peers that you were connected before, instead of like also needing to rely on Bootstrap and, and then try to find after that another peers. So yeah, this is definitely something that I will start working uh, as my main focus immediately after Stardust. So yeah, Q2. Great. Uh, and then from a spec perspective, these were the four things that you all listed as the as the priority spec work for Q1, Q2. Uh, yeah, so like the URI, URN, uh, basically did not get any attention, mostly due to me focusing on subdomains and, and other stuff. Um, yeah, I think there's there's no there's no specific use case driving that. That's just more of a, a longer term standardization arc, right? Yeah, it's mo it's mostly like uh, to to formalize it so it can be used in contexts which require like formally valid uh, URI URN. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think supporting some of the the distributed identity work as well. Uh, how about generic P2P signaling? Yeah, so this kind of goes in line with the like WebRTC distributed signaling. So there's like there's two tracks here, and we'll probably focus on the first track, which is like signaling WebRTC um, distributed, so that we can just have that over an intermediary node without relying on signaling servers. And then there's like a more generic version of it, which is just like kind of signaling for hole punching in general, because there are also like we might want to use generic signaling over a third party relay to do like TCP hole punching. Um, so there's the option to potentially do that as well, but that's like a more, that will probably punt so that we can get the WebRTC thing sooner um, and then abstract that out into a more generic uh, P2P signaling thing. So that is still targeting for, for Q2 um, along the same lines needed for distributed uh, Web RTC will be the direct connection upgrade so that we can use a relay as our signaler and then dial directly to each other over that and then kill the relay connections, assuming we don't need them anymore, but we'll probably keep them for listening. And then uh, on a completely different track from signaling is the, the peer exchange protocol, um, which is still, we should still do in Q2 because that has just a lot of value in general for being able to having another method of discovering peers when we have limited connectivity in the browser. This seems, so the, the nature of this work is more as finalizing specs, but not so much implementation. Right, so we'll have a, the, at least the proof of concept um, of that. So like that's that's the goal for Q2 is to have like the so the way that libp 2 p specs work is it will be in like it's technically it'll be in a draft state the spec will be in a draft state and then getting that proof of concept so that we have like an implementation of it and then like flushing that out so that we can move that spec potentially in like Q3 to uh like recommended because then like in Q3 we have like a full blown working implementation. Okay, great. From a, a milestone, so <laughs> specs spec. Just talked about that. Uh, are there any any deltas here from from what you would expect for JSF IPFS shipping with, with Stardust? Uh, the Go IPFS with subdomain gateways. That sounds like it's on on track. No change there. And then yeah, Q two. These other things. That Is looks this? correct from my perspective. Yeah, Look, looks looks pretty good. Uh, Go IPF, uh, subdomains will land for in Go IPFS, uh, then combine on uh, in March. Uh, not sure about JS IPFS. Uh, I need to like revisit what's their real schedule. Um, but that's not blocking uh, Go IPFS one. So, cool, fantastic. Thanks y'all for taking the time to uh, review this bit by bit with me. Ten ten minutes well spent to make sure that or we are on track to these things that we identified at Team Week as the most important things. Should we do a similar session with metrics now? 
Oh yeah. So this this one should be um pretty fun. Let's see. You all might be familiar with this sheet that I will share. Uh, so I think that the, the key here and the next piece that I need now that you all reviewed these and thought they made sense are actually to identify the data sources for each one of these. So uh, uh, down here, Reline, what's 21 through 30 are a set of metrics that we've identified. Uh, but in order to be able to track those, we need to be able to actually wire up that source of data into Grafana. <clears throat> And we're coming up with a, trying to make it as easy as possible to be able to do that. But the first step is to actually assign these to this group of people here who would know where this data is and then actually spec out like where, what would the API calls that we need to be, what are the points that we need to hit, uh, where is that data collectible, where should, and where can we write it to um, the actual uh, nuts and bolts, metal on metal collection of this data. So I think, well, while, while, let's spend a couple of minutes here. Um, I know. I know, Lytle, you did some work on this companion install bit uh, from the badging that I saw. So that seems like it should be pretty straightforward. There's an endpoint that we can hit to get that, right? Yeah, uh, both, uh, both stores uh, expose it publicly. Uh, on Chrome Web Store, there may be like a proprietary API, but we can always like use API key for our internal dashboard. All right, so, so I'm gonna add you to this one. Uh, how about for this w, uh, WS star users? Is there that's, a way to, to even that, know that at all? <laughs> that's basically when we get the signaling servers out of play. <laughs> In there it will be zero, but <laughs> a, a precise Thing to gather the numbers. I don't think so. It's just whether whether those endpoints are up and online, right? Yeah. When we take those servers down, then we'll know how many <laughs> servers are running. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so that that seems pretty straightforward. How about relay users? So this we kind of commented on. Like yeah. we don't we don't have any public relays, um, at least for that JS uses it all. So I mean, like right now, this is this is zero, um, and it's going to continue to be zero for a while, likely until we do distributed signaling, okay. um, because we'll need to have, have like limited relays in place before we before we measure that. Okay, so this metric is actually kind of like it, it's it's too early. It sounds yeah, like yeah, yeah, that would be potentially an end of year metric. So let's just add, I'll add a note saying to re review that in Q3, we can revisit and see if we're ready to actually start tracking that or not. Um, uh, the, for WSR users though, that's something where we actually want to start tracking that when? Should we track that, start tracking that in Q2? Or is that? Could, could, could we have I, like- There's a, really like, nothing to track there. It's like the servers are on or off, right? Um, yeah, I think it's when we have uh, the distributed signaling Ready? That's uh, the point when the WS star servers would well, go down. Yeah, I think a better thing to track here would be like Stardust users and WebRTC star users. Um, so one of the things that we will be tracking with WebRTC star is we'll have metrics being dumped to Prometheus, not only for like the load on the server, but also like how many joins are we getting? How many join errors are we getting? And it's like, we'll be able to see some of those actual numbers. Um, so we'll be able to pull those out and dump them in the dashboard. Can, can you update the description of this then to, cause I think that you're, I think you're right. Like that's a more, more meaningful signal for us. No pun yes. intended. <laughs> so yeah, up, update the description. And then can you write in the data source, the description of where, like of, of the, what data is going to be in Prometheus? And it sounds like we're we're too early. Are we too early for that? Or when will that go live? And when when will the, or there actually be that data available? Yeah. So I am um, I'm finishing up. I got blocked on some permissions, um, but I am finishing up the um, Docker Hub. So I'm on block on that now. So I'll finish up the Docker Hub deploy of the 
container. So we'll have that thrown up a Docker Hub, and then I will sync up with Infra, and they'll probably need like a week or two to handle provisioning, and then they'll just pull down the um, the Docker Hub image and then build the deploys from there. And then once we have that, we will be be good to start pulling that. So hopefully, okay. all in all, I would say like three to four weeks on the high end. Okay. Now we'll just need to wire that up, and we can uh, wiring up from Prometheus to Grafana is already pretty much a done done deal. So that shouldn't be difficult. Uh, bootstrap node load decrease. Who would own that, and what would it entail? Uh, so that would be when we have a persistent peer store that we would not really need to rely that much on a Bootstrap nodes. So the metric could eventually be uh, the number of uh, uh, connections that the bootstrap nodes need to have open. But it's also, I'm not sure if it's uh, achievable because if we have more connections, it's also kind of a signal that we are having more users. So I'm not sure which will be the good metric here. Yeah, this is this gets hard too because I mean you could look at like, uh, like unique peer IDs, but I don't know if like what kind of data we can get in terms of like how often are the same users coming in and talking to us, like looking at peer IDs over time, because uh, ideally Bootstrap nodes should be seeing the same peers less, right? Like unique hits from peers should be really low. Like I should join, connect to the network, get peers, and then in re reality, like I shouldn't need to talk to the bootstrap nodes again, unless I run into a situation where all of the peers in the, that I know are like undialable now, and so now I need to go back to the peers that I know are good, which are the bootstrap peers. It, it sounds like I mean unique IPs just might be a hand wavy way of doing that, right? Well, potentially, but I mean, if we're in like JS, if we have all of that, like our nodes could be uh, changing IPs all the time. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, so I think like unique, yeah, I don't know. Like if we could track unique hits per unique peer ID, like that might give us a metric that we could look right. at in terms of like how often our peers coming back to talk to us. This seems to be the way that you initially worded this though was about load decrease, but it sounds like more users might yeah. mean load increase, which is also fine. Yeah, we've made this thing better. Now more people are talking to the bootstrap notes. Right. Yeah, yeah. it's more about uh, like decreasing the amount of recurring yeah. peer IDs, like recurring peer ID usage over time. Uh, but it's like it requires basically us to store every PID and tell, like calculate the average number of times you see the same PID over some time, like window of time. But I mean, there, there, there could also be an interesting correlation here in terms of like looking at the WebRTC star and Stardust statistics in conjunction with load on the bootstrap servers. Um, because if, we, if those are high and like, our peer store storage is working well, then like in theory, we should have like a lower, that should correlate to some lower hit rate to some degree, but then yeah, like popularity will eventually cause problems with that number. So I think in the interim, it could be a very interesting number, but long-term it's probably not an interesting number in terms of like looking at peer store. If that makes sense. It sounds like a, either either we track, like track, like we store peer IDs over time and figure it out the a way of coming up with a number based on history, like the historically seen peer IDs over time, or this one it, like needs to be. Like, like it needs to be re rephrased uh, anyway, but the question is, 
is it, if we do that, would that be even a meaningful metric? Um, should we like collapse it with uh, the WebSocket star one, like uh, like WebRTC and uh, Stardust ones? Because that one sounds like more useful. One. Yeah, it's, it sounds like that, like that would tell the, st the same story, right? Like uh, without ha us having to disambiguate increased IPFS usage on the bootstrap nodes from recidivistic usage. Yeah, I feel like uh, I feel the bootstrap node load probably does may not belong. I'm not sure. Like it sounds more like something content routing group may be interested because uh, that's not like specific to a browser transports. It's a general health of the network sort of. Yeah. Like basically like tracking unique peer IDs over time. That feels like the high level uh, health analysis of the entire DHC or, or like ne the network. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I would put like a question mark if we come up with a, a meaningful way of phrasing it without uh, like gathering all peer IDs that we can. All right. Can, can, yeah. can one of you write a summary in the data source of why, why this would be meaningful and why it's hard? Yeah. So I think okay. that'll, yeah. That'll, then we, when we just have these notes captured around um, why we're not implementing it. Uh, spec blockers. This is, this is an interesting one. How, how would we measure that? And why is it meaningful? What is this? Is this how long our specs take? Because this know, could just be mean. like uh, time our spec PRs sit open if that's what we're trying to measure. It sounds like that's what we're trying to measure, but I, I don't know. You, you all decided this as a, as a meaningful thing. I'm sure it meant something to us when we wrote it. <laughs> should, um, should, should this be removed or is there like a meaningful thing that we want to track here? I mean, it could be that like specs finalized might be a better, like a better thing to actually measure, like the, the things that we were able to actually complete. Yeah. I feel it's probably maybe just like for Companion and Firefox installs, we probably would tr track like installs are not as useful as like weekly or monthly users. Right. Uh, I feel it was just like us uh, writing the stuff uh, fast. Uh, maybe it's more about like spec changes with shift or as a group. Yeah, I mean similar, like those the, similar yeah, to I feel like we should. I feel like we should blast this until we have yeah. an yeah. idea of what we actually want to track. Yeah. Delete. Uh, dev started. Again, I'm not, I'm not sure that this is a, a metric. We don't want to chase numbers with something like this, but uh, I, I, I like it as a, as a reflection of how we're, we're able to scale our ideas out to the community. And I think that's something good. Yeah, I think this is the thing of like, what is like the interesting metric is like, how many dev grants are we creating? Not that high or low or is good, but like, how many are we creating of those? How many have gotten picked up? Like, how quickly have they gotten picked up? And then how many are getting completed? Because yeah. just in terms of like, are we producing dev grants that people care about and that people are getting work done? How long are the dev grants open? Because like, we talked about like, uh, talked a little bit with Lytle earlier, like making sure that we're giving enough support to people doing dev grants so they don't end up staying open for super long because if, if people are completing dev grants and they're doing the work, but we don't have the time to like validate those, make sure it's good to like reward the dev grant at the end, then like people are just going to stop doing dev, yeah. dev grants. Yeah, I, 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 so I have these kind of marked, these kind of like top level grant stuff at the top here and to be done by the grants program. And I'd rather not have like, I'd rather not you as the browser's connectivity team have to focus on running your own kind of metrics around dev grants. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll delegate the delegate that responsibility off to the, to the grants program. And, and, you know, the people running that program then can be like, Hey, 
hey, browser team, your, your grants are getting picked up, but you're not answering them, or people aren't filing any, or things like that, right? Um, so I think those, like everything you listed, definitely are things we want to track, but at the whole grant program level, and probably not at the browsers. I'd rather you all focus on, on the browser specific bits. Yeah. So I'm, I think I'm going to delete this one as well for now and, and just have it be a, turn it into a, ideally something that we're practicing as a, as a team, as a way to scale, which we, we already are. And, and Lytle is spending a bunch of time on, on grids related stuff already. Um, the, this, <laughs> I, it has two question yes, marks. It, yes, it does. Um, and, this is like more, uh, like a vanity <laughs> metric. Uh, I, I wonder um, if there's something to, to be said, like around user agents or something like that. Like, I don't know how we're tracking implementations or, or where new traffic's coming from, or like, there's probably, we could probably tease this out and take it apart and think about where increased usage from native implementations and browsers would actually be reflected from a traffic standpoint. Not, not all browsers are equals to, so I, I agree. This is a nice vanity metric. It doesn't, doesn't tell us anything that we already didn't know and we don't know if we're falling off the wagon unless we're actually tracking tra traffic itself we see it going down yeah but it's like uh, it, it's a vanity one unless we like frame it uh, assuming the native protocol handler for browser extension lands that metric would reflect how many browser vendors adopted those patches yeah. that were uh, deliverables from that grant yeah um, but it's like it's still it's a vanity metric that requires additional description to make it more meaningful which i don't really feel good about yeah i'm, I'm i agree with you on that i feel like we're not we're not quite like from a metric standpoint this isn't gonna help move our move our visibility if our level of success forward or what if or be a warning sign if if something's falling off um how about this final one here I feel it's the same as the one marked at TBD. Okay. Effectively, we sort of like hinted that to make the uh, 26th one, to make that work, we need to reframe it to something like the last okay. one. So those are probably the same, so we can remove the last one. Okay. Remove, move it, remove it entirely? Yeah, because it's basically a duplicate of yeah, if we if we keep twenty six, then we will effectively uh, like track unique peers yeah. one way or another. All right. So this one is also TBD. So really, our uh, this one is vanity. <laughs> The progress there is going to be slow. The tracking over the years will still, it will probably always be under five for at least a couple of years. Uh, uh, but we have to have something to keep the fire alive. So it sounds like these are the web RTC star will be a, a metric for Q2 for sure. That's great. Um, companion installs, definitely something, something we want to track. I feel like we need, we need that we can do these, these two couple of metrics first. Um, but I, I would like to be able to, over time, get a more, a more sophisticated understanding of kind of what, what progress actually means. And, and may, maybe this means digging into type like connectivity types. Maybe this means adding more telemetry in different places. Maybe this means about providing more opt-in options for things like JSIPFS self-reporting, uh, ag aggregate tracking of, of network health, um, th things like that, especially as we start, like if we're crawling DHD, we're able to get out into browser nodes. Uh, counting what that actually means and exploring more creative ways of understanding the, uh, I guess the ease of use there. There's probably something else there here we could add around tracking GSIPFS users on uh, NPM and GitHub. And, and that, that if we can identify where they're part of web projects versus node projects or vice versa, um, or both, uh, the, you know, the, the, there's, there's probably something to, to see there around how well it's working in a web context, but that's from a more of like a, a developer usage and ergonomics standpoint. The, there are also like uh, JS CDNs, uh, 
like jazz deliver nice. yeah, and yeah. stuff like that and At those give you a, a solid number that you know those are jazz ipfs or jazz ipfs http client uh clients right, right. In the write it down add it yeah, that's a great idea that's gonna be that's gonna be a clearer signal than uh than github or npm stuff for sure All right, great. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate the time digging into these. It was, I think, useful. Now we have we have a smaller but more meaningful signal about uh, what, whether what we're doing is going is working or not. Totally agree. Uh, yeah, I I I would love to have that metric, like have that da data data of like historical corpus of PRIDs uh, just to see what is the network dynamic, but it's probably not something for this uh, working group to do. Um, I mean, it seems like a lot of people, a lot of our projects would benefit from having that visibility, right? Yeah. So maybe, maybe this is like file, file an issue in, in infra or something like that and kind of get the ball rolling or get my, more ideas, uh, people's thoughts of whether that would be a valuable thing. Yeah, I feel like if we we start gathering those peer IDs over time, like right now we so we've got a rough idea of un of the DHD state, but if we start gathering peer IDs and maybe multi others as well, that way we could see the proliferation like of different transports over time, um, like for local networks, local multi others, uh, IPv6. <laughs> adoption going up or uh yep totally will i will add it um native subdomain gateways go ipfs there's a pr ready for review and i'll just mention it uh because it's not merged yet um the pr is in go ipfs repo And it's gateways, subdomains, and also HTTP proxy mode. I mentioned it before, so I'll just skip to the, the, the relevant parts. If you go to the linked PR, uh, there's a link to relevant docs. Uh, and those docs basically describe how this feature would be set up uh, we via go ipfs configuration so by default uh, everything would work the same with a small difference that uh, local host host name now would be a subdomain gateway by default uh, you can disable that, that behavior with one liner basically like removing local host or setting your subdomains to false for local host host name Apart from that, uh, there is a new configuration uh, object called public gateways, which enable people to, when this PR is merged, it will enable people to define a custom uh, behavior for a specific host name. So for example, it's possible to expose only specific paths on a specific host name. If you only want IPFS but don't want IPNS or vice versa, you are able to do that with this uh, notation. Uh, you are now able to enable subdomain gateway on any host name. Here we use uh, our subdomain gateway as an example. Dweblink is a subdomain gateway. We have CIDs in uh, in a subdomain for IPFS and IPNS, uh, this is how you would create your own. Um, and still, you may want to run the old school path gateway. It's just a matter of setting your subdomains to false. You may, may expose if API on that. If you expose API on subdomain, it will get uh, a URL on API subdomain, but the API path will be the same. 
uh, and you can control if DNS link will be resolved for the host name. So you may use DNS link as a landing page for your subdomain gateway when someone opens the domain without any sub, like CID in subdomain, or you may dis decide that you don't want to run any public gateway and you just want your own website and you want just, just to use GoIPFS for publishing. So I've added some gateway re receipts at the end uh, for those most common uh, cases. So subdomain gateway, one line to set it up, path gateway, similarly, uh, enabling wildcard gateway for DNS link where you can point your domain name at Go IPFS without any nginx in front of it, and it will just uh, it will detect host name in the host header sent by your web browser, and it will resolve DNS link from DNS TXT record, and will load the proper uh, content and return it to uh, your uh, HTTP client. And finally, there's a way of uh, disabling. Uh, public gateway mode, uh, ensuring no one can force your node to fetch someone else's content. So there's a no fetch uh, option here. We disable DNS link resolve, so no one can point their host name at your IP, at your server to abuse your bandwidth. But say we you, you want to host a specific website. Let's say you have a bandwidth, but you want to contribute that bandwidth only to Wikipedia Mirror. So what you do, uh, you would like set up your DNS link pointing at your server. You would preload data to your server. So the data is not fetched, but it's already there for this specific DNS link. And then, uh, you ensure DNS link is resolved. So we got double negative here. No paths, so there's no public gateway and only this website would load. Um, those are the, the key use cases I, I've seen. If you see something that's not on this list, please comment on, on, the, on that issue, um, on that PR. Uh, it will be super useful to add it to a list of uh, examples in that form that's easy to like run as a one-liner. Um, I believe this PR will land and will ship in Go IPFS 0.5. So it would be super useful to get feedback uh, sooner than later. I love, I love the recipes. Actually, that's cool. Yeah, I, I went over like uh, some examples and just made sure it, you, you can just copy that in the console and it just works. It's much more useful than just like JSON, which when you paste it on console, you need to like, it's a mess. Um, long story short, uh, we want to make it, this trans, like transition, we want to make it easier for people to run their own subdomains. Uh, maybe uh, just like, uh, just as a quick reminder, we got this uh, public gateway checker and you, you can see like community contributed gateways and there is an origin test here. So right now we got the web link, uh, Cloudflare uh, and some third party one uh, providing the subdomain gateway feature which provides origin isolation. We want people uh, from this list and in general to be able to like provide this feature uh, without any additional hackage on the nginx side wait why why were our gateways red i thought we upgraded our gateways already is it i closed it one second um you mean ipfs io yeah oh it was red because it does not provide origin isolation it's a path based gateway i thought we up, i thought we updated uh, we got the web link for that. It's a separate origin. Um, yeah. We keep, yeah, so that's the question. I thought we, I thought we had the Nginx redirect happening on the main gateway as well. No, that's, the, that's a more uh, sort of like an open question. Uh, we discuss it and 
the, the decision at the time was to don't change the behavior on IPFS IO because a lot of people use IPFS IO for uh, like scripting using curl, wget, and if we return the redirect, a lot of tools do not expect redirect on the web. A browser will just follow the redirect and return the final payload. However, if you run curl without uh, dash l parameter, it will just return redirect without following it, and it will like break a lot of workflows. Um, it's an open question. Uh, we can always uh, flip the switch on the IPFS IO and start redirecting it to the web link. If we like add additional tests, if we check user agent, or if we, uh, there, there are ways, right? Uh, I don't want to spoil it. I got an idea how to do that, but uh, it's not ready yet. All right. Yeah, I just, didn't, I, I guess I didn't realize that we hadn't already flipped that on IPFS IO. Yeah, I, I believe like if we ask Oli, he may be a better person to answer what. Oli is uh, uh, like, he, he was working on dewebling and the decision to not touch IPFS IO uh, was made around that time. Yeah. Should we talk about test ground browser and node integration? Maybe. Hey. Hello. So I already uh, talked a little bit about this with uh, Vasco. Just wanted want to, to get some ideas from you guys to uh, start like uh, designing test plans. What type of test do you want to run? Uh, how would a setup look like and stuff like that? Um, I'm starting to have uh, conversations with Rule and all the test run guys. Um, and probably Friday, Monday, uh, around uh, around that, I'm gonna start like at least designing what the test plan would look like. Um, I wanna I wanna I wanted to get like some basic uh, test plan and some ideas for uh, further steps. Uh, so if you guys wanna uh, give me some ideas, I'm open to it. Uh, I would love to hear from you to better design those tests. So yeah, if you have any ideas, please send those to me. Uh, or if you want to have a call and discuss it a little bit, it's fine too. We are short of on time, so I'll say we'll send those scenario, testing scenarios to you. Uh, for sure, we want to be a part of that uh, test ground endeavor and the browser stuff that going forward when we got things like distributed signaling or even like uh, upgrading to WebRTC from other like, more centralized things that would be super useful to get an uh, insight to test ground into what's happening there. It's awesome, Hugo. Thank you so much for pushing this. All right, folks, uh, I will be strict with time. I will just say, hi, Andrew, and I will also say, bye, Andrew, <laughs> because we are, we are ending this call, unless you got a very super exciting news for us. I'm the entire thing, it turns out. <laughs> yes, there. <Come> <laughs> <laughs> See everybody. Um, that's, that's perfect ending. Bye. Yep. Uh